Welcome to New Testament Christian Church. Thank you for being with us today. I'm excited to be able to share this message with you. I want to ask you to go ahead and get your Bibles and be turning over to Philippians chapter 4 verse 8 as we are drawing to near the end of our series of messages entitled, What You Thinking? As we look at key things that Paul gives to church there in Philippi to think about as he draws close to the end of his letter to the church. And he wants to remind them to be encouraged in the Lord. So would you do that? And now let's be praying uh, as we get ready to go into our time with the God. Father, we love you. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. We praise you for your word, the way that you have uh, written and used men throughout history to record it for us so that we know exactly what you want for us in our lives. Father, may we be faithful to it today. May the Holy Spirit draw us in unity with those around us. May, Lord, we have a like mind faith. Uh, simply by hearing your word. May we let it touch our lives in a way that change us to be the types of men and women that you want us to be. Most importantly, Father, that we can trust you fully because of everything you've promised in your word. We just pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. As I mentioned, we're kind of getting uh, to the end of this series of messages. We have one more left in this uh, series, What You're Thinking?, Today we're going to be talking about things that are excellent, but let's get caught up with the verse and then move forward. Scripture says in Philippians chapter 4 verse 8, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. That original word in the Greek had its uh, basic sense meaning of excellence that's there, uh, of any kind. The term may also uh, mean moral virtue. We could use a lot of that in our society today, couldn't we? In its earliest appearances in the language, it, it had this notion of excellence, uh, was ultimately bound up with the notion of fulfillment of purpose or function. In other words, what's God created you to be? And what has God created you to do? The act of living up to one's full potential. That's what God wants for you and I. And he wants us to do it the best we possibly can do it. So it had to do with, and still does, with character and virtue. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31 says, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Colossians chapter 3, verse 17 says, And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So with that in mind, I want us to consider some things that are excellent today. Uh, remember, Paul, in this final chapter, is encouraging the church. That's going to be us as well now, as we're one of his readers. Those Christian brothers and sisters, especially that in that time of, in the church at Philippi, to live a life worthy of Christ and one that would imitate Christ. He reminds them to remain steadfast and united for the sake of the gospel. And just prior to this exhortation here in, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, he, he gives all these readers, as well as us, some wonderful advice. Let's consider three huge things that we could consider to be excellent by anyone. Number one, how about this? How about rejoicing in Jesus? Amen? Rejoicing in Jesus. There's a lot of things we could be rejoicing about, and yet we get caught up in the world around us, and we fail to remember we can rejoice in Jesus any time. That's what Paul tells the church there. Even though there's things going on in the world around them, he tells them in verse 4, chapter 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. He didn't say just do it when things are great and the way you like them. He said you rejoice always in the Lord. Now, rejoice simply means to be glad. But it means to be glad in a, an excited, happy way. So many people rejoice and are glad when maybe the bills are paid at the end of the month and you, you realize that I've got a little extra left over. Wow, I'm getting on top of things. Maybe you become debt free and you rejoice and you're glad about that. People rejoice and they're glad when they get a promotion at work. They rejoice and they're glad maybe uh, when they get a good grade on a test at school. I, we have these young people uh, that come to our church and they're gathered and as they're doing the virtual learning and it gives them a safe place to be and people help them as best as they possibly can and encourage them, read with them, tutor if they can. 
And, and, and I love the way they'll, when I walk by or they'll pop in my office, Mr. Daniel, I got 100 on my quiz today. They're rejoicing. They're glad about that. And they should be. We rejoice when we uh, get a new car or a new home, uh, new clothing, a new recreational vehicle of some sorts. Anything could fall in. And we rejoice and we're glad. And the Bible says rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. And so they should rejoice. Well, how about this one? We, we rejoice and we're glad when the doctor says we caught it in time. There's some of you today that you're, you're rejoicing right now. Maybe this week you've got a test result. And you're, you're rejoicing. There are people who've had the COVID test this week. Maybe you got a negative test. And you rejoiced and you were glad because you did not have the disease. But let me ask you this thing. Are you, are you glad you're in the house of the Lord when you're able to be there? Or are you rejoicing when you show up? So many people fail to remember it's a time of rejoicing and they should be glad to be in the house of the Lord. The psalmist said in Psalm 122 verse 1, I rejoice with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Now, you remember, we're not just sitting there and doing our own thing. We're, we're making an effort to be there. And he said, I rejoice when they said to me, let's go. I'm ready. He's like, well, I was just sitting on ready myself. I was waiting for you to say you were ready to go. And there are many who would give anything to be where you and I are on a weekly basis, to hear the word of the Lord, to, to be able to listen to, to the people singing praises to the name of Jesus and lifting him up in honor and glory of all who he is, or to be able to be around the Lord's table in sweet communion and fellowship with the Lord and his people. There are many who love to be able to come into the house of the Lord and bring him an offering simply because he's so worthy of receiving those offerings. Now, are you one of those people who rejoice about being in the house of the Lord? Or how about this? Are you rejoicing that Jesus is your Savior and Lord? That's the biggest thing we, any of us should be willing to rejoice about. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, for, for the Son of Man came to seek and save what was lost. Listen to what he said. For the Son of Man, speaking of Jesus, he himself says these words, came looking for you and I. Whether we want to admit it or not, all of us have been lost or are lost at this very moment. There's some right now, as you're watching this, you are either a person who was lost and has been found by Jesus, or you are a person who is lost and has not accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, though he is right there. He's found you, but you're not willing to take hold of what he's offering, and you're still lost. Now, that's not me saying that. That's what God's Word says. You have to make a choice. And once we realize our lost state, we must be willing to turn to Jesus. The Bible, in Jesus' own words, says that, that we are saved because we were sought out by him. So he's seeking you out. He just asked that we trust him and follow him and surrender to him. You know, he's seeking you out today. There's no mistake why you are here watching this uh, video today or this message of, of, of this service. God has a plan for you. He wants you to connect with him. I found you. I finally located you today. Here we are together. Walk with me. He's all he's asking. And so every one of us find ourselves in one of those two places. We've either been lost and been found by Jesus, or we are lost and still needing to be found. And if you've been found and saved, then that's something to rejoice about. Be glad that you're a saved individual. Don't let the world around you tell you, well, you're following something that's no longer valid in the world today because the world around us seems to be going to hell, doesn't it? And the one thing we can rejoice in is that we are followers of the Most High God. He is the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. We can rejoice in that. Jesus says in Luke chapter 10, verse 20, However, do not rejoice that the Spirit submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Now, many people rejoice because of what they can do as a result of being a follower of Christ. Don't get me wrong. There, there truly is power in the name of Jesus. Yet Jesus says, even if spirits were to submit to you because you are a follower of mine, don't rejoice in that. You rejoice because your name is written in heaven. 
That's the thing you need to hold on to. Not what's going to take place here, but what's going to take place there. And this world is quickly passing away before our very eyes. And so, dear friends, celebrate the small victories. Yes, here as they come, as God blesses you with them. But remember, that's exactly what they are. They're simply small victories. The greatest victory is that your name is going to be written in heaven in the Lamb's Book of Life. And so rejoice, saints, if you are a follower of Jesus. You rejoice in that. In Acts chapter 8, we read the, of the conversion of a man that the Lord has sent a disciple named Philip to meet. This man had been to Jerusalem, and while he was there, uh, he picked up a copy of the scroll of Isaiah, and he's trying to read it as he's traveling along in his chariot. He was a dignitary from Ethiopia. And, and as he was traveling along, the Lord told Sp Philip through the Holy Spirit, you go and join yourself alongside of this chariot. Just, just get nearby it. And as he gets there, he hears this man reading the words of Isaiah. And here was all that Philip said. Do you understand what you're reading? And the man said, how can I unless somebody explains it? Is he talking about himself or someone else? And he gets, Philip gets invited into the chariot. And it says he took that passage of Scripture, and from that point, he explained to him Jesus. And as they're traveling along this road, wherever they're heading, they find this large body of water. And as they get there, the Bible says these words, that he commanded his chariot to stop. He didn't say, hey, pull over right here. He said he commanded it to stop. And he says, here's a large body of water. What's going to keep me from being baptized and at that, that moment, they got down, they went down into water, and Philip baptized the man. And when the Bible says this, this took place right after that. In Acts chapter 8, verse 39. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him anymore. But listen to what he says. But went on his way rejoicing. You know why? Because he found Jesus, and he'd been baptized into Christ. But he also, maybe, like you and I, we must understand, maybe we can rejoice in Jesus if we can answer this question. Are you glad he has pardoned your sins? Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 and 8 says, Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, and the bride has made herself ready. Speaking of the church, those who would accept Jesus. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given to her to wear. The prophet Isaiah said, though your sins are as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. And though they are as red as crimson, they shall be like wool. So let me ask you again. Are you glad that he's pardoned your sins? Oh, my friends, if you're glad he's pardoned your sins, then rejoice. Be glad. Don't let yourself be downcast today. No matter if you're sitting in your living room or, or maybe you're on your break at work watching this on your phone or your tablet. Rejoice right where you are. Because he's pardoned your sins. Rejoicing in Jesus is an excellent thing. But here's another one. How about this? Trusting our daily cares to Jesus. A lot of going on in the world around us, isn't there? And yet the, the, the Apostle Paul said in verse 6 of chapter 4, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. In a world, it seems that it has literally gone to hell before our very eyes. It, it, it is so hard at times not to become anxious about many different things. People are anxious about the pandemic of COVID-19. Rightfully so. People have been sickened and even died because of it. People are anxious about upcoming elections. People are anxious about Supreme Court justice nominees. People are anxious about financial uh, financially meeting the needs of their families. When it comes down to it, you know what they're really anxious about? People are anxious that their lives are not prepared for what the future holds. Maybe that's you today. You're not talking about just today where we're living. But we're also talking about eternity, aren't we? You know God is speaking to you at this very moment. And so amidst all that, Paul gives us this wonderful little piece of advice. Don't be anxious. Give it to God. Don't be anxious. Give it to God. And I know what you're thinking. Boy, it's easier said than done. You know, what, what you and I need to do is not forget about a huge detail that's nestled in between the verse that we just looked at earlier that told us to rejoice. 
Remember, he says rejoicing in Jesus is going to be a good thing. It's a great thing. Paul intentionally starts with that to get us focused in the right place. We need to be focused on Jesus, not on ourselves and the world around us. He understands that it seems that the world is going to hell around us. We, we've got that down pat. So he says, rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. But here's why he can, he can say that and not be anxious about anything. Nestled right between rejoice and, and anxious is a, the key to it all. And that is the latter part of verse 5. Philippians chapter 4, verse 5 says, the Lord is near. That's something to rejoice about. Well, preacher, you don't understand. There's a pandemic going on. The Lord is near. Well, if this election doesn't go the way it should, the right way, the Lord is near. I can tell you that if they don't pick the right person for the Supreme Court, the Lord is near. Well, preacher, the future is just so uncertain. The Lord is near. Can, can you sense his presence? If, if you can, don't be anxious. He's got you. Haven't you got that figured out? He's got you. He sought you out. He wants to save you or already has. So he's got you. So pray. Petition him. Thank him. In everything the Lord is near. So trusting our daily cares to Jesus is an excellent thing to think about. And maybe here's the final one we could think about today. Surrendering our hearts and our minds to Jesus. Here's what he says in verse 7 of Philippians chapter 4. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. My dear friends, what's it going to take to be able to rejoice in Jesus for you? What is it going to take for you to surrender all your cares and anxieties to him? Well, it's simple. We must be willing to surrender the two strongest things that we have to Jesus. Our hearts and our minds. In all the things we just mentioned, do you think God is scared or even nervous or shuddered at anything that's been going on around us. You better believe he doesn't. He's in complete control. And I hope you can understand and trust that he is a God who is in complete control. Just consider the peace of God. Think about it now. Just wow. Just, just for a minute. What it must be like. Uh, not to be worried about anything. Not to have to anything in the world folk, uh, you know, throw you off balance in any way. The Bible says it even transcends all understanding. In other words, as much as we may try, we'll never be able to comprehend it. But at the same time, the same peace is available to you and I if we simply trust Jesus and we surrender everything to him, our heart and our mind. And our everything, that's just it. It's our heart and our mind, isn't it? Our heart led me to do this. My thoughts drove me to do that. Sometimes following your heart is not always the right thing. Sometimes trying to overthink is not going to be the right thing. There's going to be such a thing as faith that's going to, have to come in. There's going to be some things you have to believe in you can't see, and you're going to have to trust it with all your heart so that you can have complete faith. That's what God's calling you for today, that you would surrender your heart and mind to him. And then he can open your understanding. We're always looking for security in one, way, one form or another, aren't we? We lock our doors at home and, and, and we do it to keep our families and our valuables and our possessions safe. We store our valuables in, in safes and safe deposit boxes. We, 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 we rent them at the bank we, because we want to protect them and we want to guard them. But even those things are only so secure. Homes get broken into and banks have been robbed. And, and I found myself watching recently some gentlemen from the United Kingdom. Uh, magnet fishing of all things. They have this large magnet, uh, you know, it can hold on. It's got really strong powers, 900 pounds of, you know, where it can latch onto something. You can't hardly pull it off. And they'll, they have these long ropes and they'll toss them out and they just start near bridges and, and, and they start in the waterways and canals and they pull it back in to see what's stuck to it. 
And, and let me just tell you some of the things that they found. They, they found jewelry. They found money, coins and stuff. Uh, they found cash boxes, safes of all sizes, and even parking meters from around town. I mean, thieves would literally take the parking meter because they had coins in them. They would take the entire parking meter to break the cash box, to get the change out of it, and then toss the parking meter into the river. I mean, there's only so much security, isn't there? And so what this tells me is that with there only being so much security in the world, there can't be but so much peace. Yet Paul says that we can have the peace of God. There is nothing that shakes God. There is nothing that will move him. There is nothing that he can't defeat in this world. He is bigger than this world because he created this world. There is nothing that can take anything from him. He is in complete control of who he is and what belongs to him. And that includes you and me. So here's how I know that. Because Jesus said so. In Luke chapter 10, verses 28 through 30, Jesus says these words. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one can snatch them out of my father's hand. And then he says these beautiful words. I and the father are one. So if you're trying to get to the Father, you must go to Jesus and trust that he's got you. You can be secure in him. Jesus can guard our hearts and minds when we completely surrender them to him. So let me ask you, have you considered surrendering your heart and your mind, which then controls your very soul to Jesus? And if you haven't, what are you waiting for? Listen to the Bible as we get ready to close in Acts chapter 22, verse 16. And now what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. Oh, my dear friends, if we need to think about some excellent things today, rejoicing in Jesus is at the top of the list. But surrendering our daily cares to him, God, you're bigger than all this. I give it all to you. But most importantly, God, I can do that because I have given you my heart and my mind. I'm going to be completely devoted to you. I'm no longer going to be separated. I'm all in. And if that's the choice you're making today, what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized in the name of, God, in the, name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit right where you are. May God bless you until we're together again. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your faithfulness. I praise you for those who are taking part in this service today. May we be faithful to you. May we walk in a way that we can fully trust you. May we be focused on the things that are excellent in our life that we've mentioned today. Jesus, you're worthy of everything we have. May we be completely focused on you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.